Now, moving on to the next talk. Now, I would like to welcome Professor Dr. Krishna Bandula, Professor Emeritus, University of Massachusetts, Loyal USA. Former introduction of Professor Bandula, and his talk will be presented by the session chair. At this moment, I would like to welcome and request the chair, Professor Dr. Arshad M. Chaudhary, Dean, <coughs> School of Engineering, Brack University, Bangladesh, to conduct the session. Let's welcome Professor Dr. M. Chaudhary. Sir, the floor is yours. Uh, good morning from Bangladesh. I hope you can uh, listen to my voices, right? Is it okay? So welcome to the next session, uh, session two of this day. Uh, second day of this uh, workshop. Our next topic is going to be achieving global excellence in engineering education through outcome-based education is most relevant uh, topic we are talking in these days in our community, education community, higher education especially. So the, the speaker of this session will be Dr. Krishna Bedula. So let me welcome Professor Vedula to this session. Dr. Krishna Vedula is recently raised, uh, is, is a retired for professor of chemical engineering and Dean Emeritus Francis College of Engineering, University of Massachusetts, Loyal. He is the founder and executive director of the Indo Universal Collaboration for Engineering Education. Dr. Vedula is globally known for his research in processing and properties of materials for high temperature applications. He is a fellow of American Society for Metals and a fellow of the American Society for Engineering Education. He is also past president of International Federation of Engineering Education Societies. So welcome, uh, Professor Vedula, to this session. We are eagerly looking forward to learn from you uh, with your experience, and especially uh, on the issue of outcome-based education. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Professor Chaudhary, and Dr. Professor Chaudhary. Very good. It's a real pleasure to be uh, to be with this group. Uh, as you have mentioned, I uh, have just retired uh, from University of Massachusetts Lowell. I was the dean of engineering there, and a professor. And I decided to come back uh, to India, where I was grew up. My first 21 years of my life was in India. I spent the last 45 years of my 50 years of my life in the United States in the area of engineering education. I was from my academic field most of the time. And I had a lot of experience in, you know, as, as the head of the department, dean, going through various accreditation cycles with ABET or you know, in various places all over the uh, United States. And so I decided to come back to India, settle down in India, and, and help some of the engineering colleges in India uh, through this process of uh, you know, going from traditional engineering education to uh, outcome-based education. So that, that's a little bit of the background. So my, my talk will be more focused on the, um, on, on the efforts that we have done in this, in this area of working with almost 100 engineering colleges in India. Uh, and, and so um, yeah, you know, I, I started this even before I retired for the last 10 years. So let me share my screen and, uh, and get started here. Uh, let's see. So again, I thank you all for the um, this opportunity to share my thoughts with all of you, and I'm assuming you can see the screen right now. Uh, the um, yeah, I, I think uh, Professor Toglanini, uh, the early, uh, speaker earlier, brought up some very very important um, uh, issues related to uh, to assessment, which is a very critical part of um, of our research education. So. Uh, uh, what I will do is part of the time I will spend on the overall approach that we have taken to helping colleges in engineering education in India and, uh, and, and, and how that is connected to uh, transition from traditional to outcome-based education. Okay, so uh, uh, so is right now I'm full-time with this organization, Indo-Universal Collaboration for New Education, the non-profit society organization in India. And, and as uh, Professor Chaudhary mentioned, I just recently retired as a professor and dean at the Lowell. So I, I would like to emphasize the concept of an ecosystem. It's not just one or two things that you do. You have to build an overall ecosystem in an institution to, to transition from uh, traditional to autonomous education. And, and what is the ecosystem? You know, I'll kind of try to explain that process and how we have tried to do it. Uh, with some success, and it's still a long-term project. Uh, it's uh, not that easy to do. It's very complicated. So, uh, so the IUCE, you know, provides this ecosystem 
uh, to about 100 colleges in India, and we're trying to expand that even beyond. Now, what is the ecosystem? You know, if you look, think about the ecosystem, it's this beautiful, you know, skies, uh, sun, clouds, you know, mountains, water, and, uh, you know, you know, vegetation, and, you know, yeah, all, all these kinds of, this is all part of the ecosystem. And, you know, and if the ecosystem is in nice equilibrium, then we all live happily. So that's really, you know, so we need to provide different elements of an ecosystem uh, so that, uh, you know, life survives health happily. Uh, in the same way, engineering education, you know, to improve its quality, we need to provide an ecosystem of various types of things, programs and activities. Okay, so, so right now we have you know, 50 very active institutions throughout India, working as part of the way of a consortium. Another 50 are there you know, trying to understand what we're trying to do. Uh, we have created a network over the last 10 years of about 100 global experts from all over India. These are you know, people who are of Indian origin, non-Indian origin, uh, different parts of the world. Uh, it used to be mostly United States based, but now we have very people, a lot of people from other parts of the world, including Australia, uh, who are part of this team, who are very active in, uh, in, in providing an ecosystem. As I said, ecosystem means engaging all of these people in different types of activities that we need to improve our colleges. And so, uh, and so the colleges and the, uh, and, and the uh, uh, experts, you know, they, they, they work to be work together. And, and, and IUC provides that kind of a network of sharing and collaboration uh, uh, between the consortium members and uh, colleges, as well as with the global network of experts, which consists not just academic, but also industrial experience and, and various other backgrounds. And my good friend, uh, uh, Michael Milligan, uh, who is the uh, CEO of AIRBET, uh, is, is a very active member of this network. And in fact, that is how I got connected to this, to your group, to this conference, because I think uh, somebody approached him and he said, hey, why don't you talk to Krishna Vadula? He might be able to give you a good talk. So I want to thank my good friend, Michael, Michael Milligan, uh, for introducing me to your, your network and uh, hopefully this can lead to some you know, long-term collaborations with you all. So, I, uh, so we sat down with our management's leadership of the institutions in, in, in these colleges. We sit down periodically with them and because we want to understand what is it that you want to do? What are your priorities, right? It's not enough to say, okay, I, we should do this, but I, I need to understand what are your priorities? And, and clearly you know, in India, there's something called the uh, NIRF ranking. Everybody wants to be high ranked. Uh, obviously accreditation is important in India. This is NBA accreditation. Of course, you know, other, country, other countries are different organizations. Everybody you know, wants to do online delivery because that's now this year, that's become big, most important thing. Everybody wants to uh, wants the colleges to get funding for projects and programs from government agencies and private agencies. GST is a government agency in India. Everybody wants industry collaborations and get replacements and all, all institutions and uh, academic research publications, patents, collaboration with national institutions. And, and I'm sure you know, East West University has similar ambitions and similar priorities in, in how you look at your education process and how you would uh, you know, offer the process, uh, offer education to your students you know, in such a way you, you know, you have uh, these, uh, you know, uh, the achieve these, these uh, final uh, results. Uh, but in this context, in order to get all of those priorities, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, uh, ranking and accreditation and visibility, you, you, know, you, you have to go through uh, this process of accreditation, which is an important pillar uh, in, in, in that process. Okay, so if you look at the National Board of Accreditation, that is what we have the you know, equivalent, it's a, a, mem a the Washington Accord, member of the Washington Accord. And so if you look at the graduate out outcomes and learning attributes in there, you know, I just summarized the key words from the top 10 graduate attributes. Okay, knowledge-based engineering, problem analysis, investigation, design, use of engineering tools, individual teamwork, communication skills, professionalism, impact on your society environment, ethics and equity, economics and project management, lifelong learning. So it's interesting to look at this list and say, wow, okay, you know, do we do this stuff? Okay, do we do all of these things in the classrooms and different, different colleges? Do we do that? that? That's really what NBA wants us to do. And, 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 and if you look at it, if you look at the, at the top, uh, most of our traditional curriculum, most of our traditional work that we do in the classroom is focused on the top five. You know, we, 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 uh, the, the remaining, we, we really don't pay that much serious attention to it. By the way, we kind of did it mostly because our faculty themselves are not sure how to do these things. Okay, so that's, that, and that's, you know, um, more than 50% of these attributes are related to non-technical things, non-traditional curriculum. Okay, that's very important, don't, don't, don't notice that. And, and, and that's really what's gonna lead to a high quality program. If you can make sure that you can do those things that are highlighted in yellow, six to 12. And it's not easy for faculty to do this thing because we have never, never taught them how to do these things, okay? So, and, and, and then let's go to ABIT, okay? What, what, what are the graduate attributes and learning outcomes in ABIT? Okay, let's look at them. They have gone through some transformation changes in the last one year. 
prior to that, they also had, I think, 12 or something. And, and now they have seven, okay? You, you look at their seven, okay? And, and, and you look at the first one says, ability to solve complex problems, okay? So, so that means it's not just one dimensional, it's about you know, interdisciplinary complex problems, real world problems, okay? And applying engineering design to produce solutions, communicate effectively, you know, recognize ethical professional responsibilities, okay? Work as a team, you know, function, work with teams and able to develop and, and conduct appropriate uh, experimentation, apply all new knowledge, lifelong learning. So these are all similar concepts like what I showed you for NBA. You know, it's a lot of overlapping types of things that you know, all, most accreditation agencies around the world, including Australia and other places, all have similar work words in their graduate attributes, okay? So, so, so the, the, the important point here is that many of these attributes are non-technical attributes. They're not taught in our traditional curriculum that, you know, that countries like India and Bangladesh and even in the United States, you know, we never focused on, 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 on these kinds of things before the people in, uh, you know, in, uh, around us, people who hire engineers, industry, society, you know, they started commenting on what we were doing. Say, hey, you guys are not producing engineers that are uh, employable. You're not, you're not producing engineers who can work in, you know, work in teams, who can, who can think of the relevance of what they're doing uh, with the society, uh, the ethics, professional management, communication skills, work and, and solve complex problems. You're not producing those kinds of engineers. You're just making them uh, go through conventional curriculums uh, in which they just uh, mug up a, a, a bunch of equations and, and solve some uh, problems at the end of the textbook and then you, uh, uh, vomit it out in the exams and, and, and pass and pass and get a degree. They, they don't, they, and, and so, and, and, and so, and we're surprised that the industry and the society say they're not, they're not employable. Hey, what's there to be surprised about? We're, we're training them to be, you know, to, to not have any of these skills, uh, just to mug up and pass exams. And, and then we're surprised that the industry says they're not employable. Okay, so we have to change. Okay, we have to change and focus on the types of things that we have not been traditionally doing. Okay, that's what outcome is education about. It's not rocket science. It's very simple, focusing on these concepts that are in yellow. How do we incorporate these things? And we have good faculty members who are very good at doing the traditional curriculum content and so on, but equations and so on and so on. This is the stuff that does not come with equations, does not come with formulas. This has to be done in a way that's very, you know, that has to be very sensitive to the human being, the needs and, and society and so on. So how to achieve these outcomes? particularly the ones that I highlighted in yellow. Okay, that's really the, the transition from, uh, you know, from traditional to, to outcome-based education. Now, this is a traditional teaching, right? Look at traditional teaching. This is what happens, right? You sit in a classroom. This is what everybody, all over the 19, uh, most of the classrooms that even today look like this, right? And, and you know, so you sit, you know, next, somebody sits standing out there and talk. That's traditional. That's, this is the traditional way of teaching. Okay, so I can ask the question, and this is a mantra that we use in our organization, IUC, I'm teaching, are they learning? If that professor that is teaching, you think the students are learning anything out of that? Okay, so I mean, so the, out, the outcome is what's important, all right? So this is a mantra. So, so we have to change our mindset. We have to change uh, the way we teach and how we teach and how we incorporate some of the things that, that the accreditation agencies want us to, you know, want us to include, which, which is, you know, it's not just the agency, it's the society wants us to do that stuff. Society wants engineers who can help solve problems in society, the grand challenges, you know, the you know, sustainable development goals, I mean, you know, the industry and so on. And so again, same problem here, right? We have, we have gone virtual mode, again, the same thing, right? Traditional, just there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, the screen out there and we are sitting out here. And again, this is very, very traditional. We have to break the mold and try to figure out how to incorporate much more interactive, uh, you know, means of teaching uh, both in traditional and in the in, in online mode, okay? And the online mode is even more difficult. So it needs some lot of creativity in terms of changing the way we teach in order to incorporate a lot of the things like teamwork, communication skills, project-based learning, experiential learning, doing projects, all of that stuff is something that's very, very critical. So, so I wanna emphasize that, that you can learn engineering only by doing engineering, okay? And most of what they teach them in the traditional classroom, they're not doing engineering. There's a mugging up engineering. This memorizing concept. They're not doing engineering. That's not that's not engineering, right? The mugging of stuff. They're not doing engineering. Okay. If I want to teach somebody how to ride a bicycle, if I give them a PowerPoint slides and exams on how to ride a bicycle, they might get hundred percent, but they will not know how to ride a bicycle. Only way to ride a bicycle is to get on the bicycle, fall down, make mistakes, fall down again, get somebody to help you on the bicycle, get up again. Eventually, you learn how to ride a bicycle. That is engineering. We learn engineering only by doing engineering, not by mugging up stuff and 
passing exams on en about engineering. That's important, but that's not enough. Okay, so you go back traditionally. What is engineering? You go back all the way to history, historical perspective. Here is a caveman, okay, person way in the thousands of years ago. He had a need. His need was food. He said, I, I see those animals running around, a rabbit or some other animal running around that, that looks like it might be good food. So I said, I need to design a tool so that I can kill that animal and eat it. So I have a need and I use the engineering approach to design a tool to satisfy my need. That is what engineering is. Engineering is nothing, not something new that was invented in the industrial revolution or after that or so on. It has been around in society, engineering concept of engineering. You look around, there are needs. Okay, there's a water shortage, there's air pollution, there's crime, you know, all kinds of things. There are needs out there to make, to help us address those needs so we become happier, right? We have to look at those needs and design appropriate solutions to address those needs and take care of our, and make ourselves you know, more happy. And, and, and so it's been around for many, many years. This, you know, in this caveman, for example, looked around and said, okay, I need a tool. And he looked around, there's a piece of stick there. And he said, okay, how do I make a tool out of the stick? We don't you know how to do it. Let me take the stone, make a tool out of this. So maybe I'll throw the stone at the animal. That didn't work. I throw the stick at the animal, it doesn't work. So then he was trying to say, okay, I'm going to flex this, this, uh, this stick a little bit. Oh, it's elastic. Oh, it's, and, and they discover elasticity. So if I bend it and I attach something from the tree, like a rope like thing, oh, I got a bow and I got this little arrow. I can put a little sharp object to the end. And, and, and this is highly sophisticated design concept here involved. In, in, in designing a bow and arrow. And this was done thousands of years ago. That's what we need to teach our students to do, to look at a problem and find ways to, to design things that will solve those problems, okay? And this is not the design process, okay? So, and it's, it's, it's common, it's everybody knows, uh, many people know about it. And I just want to walk you through the process and, and point out that, that if you have students go through this process, they automatically, develop all the attributes that I pointed out in NBA and ABET, okay? Looking at a need, clarifying the problem, okay? And looking at a need. So, you know, interact, interact with the people who have the need and understand what the problem is. And, and, and that way you're learning skills, communication skills with the customer, the client, okay? And you work together with the team to understand that, to discuss it. You do some research on, on what, what's involved in addressing that problem. This might be a simple problem such as you know, clean water in the neighboring village or it might be a more complicated problem such as a, 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 a jet engine for, for a new type of aircraft. It could be anything like you know, the problem is there's a need. So you clarify the problem that involves, you know, not just looking at the back of the textbook or putting an equation and add some numbers into the equation. It requires looking at the problem, understanding the need, talking to the customer, people who are gonna use the solution and then working as a team because you need people from different backgrounds and doing some research investigating in step two. And then it's okay, now I have all this in brainstorming that I've done with a team, I've communicated with my people, with folks understood the problem a little bit. Let me find some possible solutions. There won't be one possible, so there'll be alternate, many, many possibilities will be there. Okay, then I say, okay, now as a team, we communicate, we talk about the pros and cons of different solutions and then come up with maybe one, let's try this one. Okay, it looks more promising than the other. Let's try this one, okay? And I, so clarify and justify one solution. Build a prototype, you know, show it to the customer. Okay, is this what you think might work? Do uh, you show it to your manager? Is this what's gonna work? Build a prototype, okay? That's part of design thinking, right? And develop, and, and develop it and build it and then test it, okay? All of this involves teamwork, understanding of the real world, understanding of society, working in, you know, uh, and, and, and all of the types of things that we mentioned in the, uh, in the project management, financial management, uh, lifelong learning. You have to learn from things that are new things that are coming out in society. So, and so what, and build the prototype and, and then you might test it. You might say, hey, it didn't work. Okay, and that's fine. That's like riding a bicycle. You fall down once, you get up and try again. Didn't work the first time. So you go back to point uh, two, research, do some more research or maybe pick another alternate solution. And, and try that one. And so go back and forth and back and forth through the design process till you get something that, that, you, that, you, get, that you get might work. And, and then you start scaling it up, you're marketing you know, and, 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 you, and you might become an entrepreneur with a new product or you might be doing something for a company, developing a product for them and, and then you communicate, okay? So communication skills are important throughout this process. So if you, so if you look at this process, it automatically includes all of the things that, that ABIT requires or NBA requires with the, in, in terms of the outcome-based education not the traditional mug up and pass exams approach, okay? So students must do projects. That's the lesson here, okay? 
to achieve outcome. They must do projects. And that people have been talking about it, project-based learning, experiential-based learning, all of that is very critical, absolutely. If students do projects automatically, most of the things that are listed in the NBA or ABET uh, will, will, you'll find that they'll be satisfied. All you have to then do is document it somehow to satisfy the visitor when they come in. Look, this project is done and this, and this is the types of things the outcome came out of it, okay? So students must do projects in as many courses as now as possible, okay? Most of our faculty will go, oh yeah, yeah, projects must be done. Oh, but it should be done in that one course in the final year. That's when you do projects, right? In my course, I'm just gonna teach stuff from the book and you just get mug up and pass exams. All my, but, I, but that project has been somewhere else. No, everyone, including the math professor, including the math courses must do projects in their course. And it's possible to do that. Okay, look at, let's go online and Google, you'll find information how you can do projects in a mathematics course. Okay, so project-based learning in every course that you can find, put them all in there. You know, get faculty trained, this is difficult for faculty to understand how to do this because they've been trained to just teach in the traditional way, like the picture I showed you. Okay, how to do projects, they don't know how to do that, how to teach students how to do projects. So, so they have to learn, every subject can be, there can be some projects in there and the people can work in teams and come up with, I think. So, and in addition to that, projects can be outside the curriculum. Let's come together as teams and work on things like the uh, uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals. Okay, United Nations has said, these are the problems we all are, every country faces. India has some of the most polluted kind of cities uh, and water problem. Okay, and now every country has issues like that. Projects can be found in a neighboring village or a neighboring town in your own neighborhood with all many of these issues. Get the students to form teams and go out there and identify the need and use design thinking to find a solution and implement a small solution to the project. That process is gonna give them the skills that they need to satisfy the accreditation the at graduate attributes. Whether it's working on a clean water project in a nearby village or helping a small middle school, you know, improve the way they teach mathematics. A team of engineering students can go there and do that. Doing projects, learning how to plan and implement projects and then finally so it's evaluating and so on is important. So, or you can work on the grand challenges, you know, National Academy of Engineering has uh, brought, you know, has done the, uh, has, has, has talked about the grand challenges. And again, there's lots of stuff there. And, and, and so, so, the, so, so anyway, so, so that is what we have been focused, trying to do. It's not easy. Okay, that's what IUC and the Universal Collaboration on Education. This is the approach uh, to provide an ecosystem for project-based and experiential learning in our 50 colleagues that are very active and another 100 colleagues that you know, we also you know, try to bring in and convince them this is important. It's not easy because the mindset is difficult to change. Mindset of most faculty members that we hire is from the old way of thinking, okay? And then now, now you tell them, okay, you, do, you go to outpaces of education, they will just use the old way of thinking to approach the new way of thinking, which is not, doesn't work, okay? They just, again, okay, we're gonna memorize stuff. So the, whatever we're supposed to do, you know, we'll put things in boxes and do all kinds of stuff. So, so anyway, the ecosystem that, you know, that we are developing over a period of last several years, uh, you know, which includes a whole bunch of things. And you know, we have courses for, for faculty, okay? We call this teacher certification course. We have some courses on online teaching for the faculty in the colleges. We have courses on, on, on how to do research, research methods, uh, how, to, how to do engineering education research, how to publish on engineering education, how to do outcome-based education, how to uh, make your campus clean and green, and how to develop mobile apps for uh, remote internships. And all of these uh, significant emphasis on using projects of learning how to do projects in various areas. Uh, we have a you know, uh, director you know, of uh, the uh, courses for students. Okay, we have a student leadership course where we talk to them about the, about the grand challenges, National Academy of Engineering and sustainability goals and have them go around to communities and work as teams, uh, develop the leadership skills by doing projects. Okay, soft skills course, for entrepreneurship course. I think we, in, in most of our countries, we, we should be, it's not enough for for the students to learn things that will make them employable because they just only so many jobs. They must learn to be entrepreneurs. They should be job creators rather than job seekers. They have to have job creators so they can then go out there and, ident and use design thinking to identify the need, find a solution and, and try it out and become entrepreneurs and eventually make their own lives and you know, make money for themselves and hire other people. Okay, so that's important. And then all this 
new buzzwords, artificial intelligence, machine learning, you know, all the emerging technology, very important. Again, we have to make sure our, our students understand that and not just mug up concepts. How do those concepts help in real world projects? Can I use artificial intelligence to solve the problem of, uh, of health in a nearby village? Okay, it's possible to use certain tools and techniques and all that to, you know, to use artificial intelligence for in many, many social contexts. Okay, so, and, and, and so we have cyber, cyber hygiene, virtual labs, we have smart manufacturing and so on. So, so many things that we do together uh, and, and, and we have co-teaching courses, with global experts, short workshops, guest presentations, you know, guidance, et cetera, and, and so on. Okay, so this is what our hundred experts, you know, I'm gonna engage them in various ways uh, and move to move in that direction. We have, uh, you know, we use this technology, online technology. We use GoToMeeting and, and Zoom every, every week. We have two or three uh, lectures where, uh, from uh, people from around the world on different topics. And, and our consortium members have access to the recordings and then they get together once in a way to discuss what they learned. Uh, I want to spend a couple of minutes on this, on this, uh, I'm just gonna check my watch here and do, you know, see, make sure I'm not running out of time. I think I've used up 35, 25 minutes, I think so, right, okay. So, uh, so, uh, so we, this is an important program that I think is relevant to you know, anywhere in the world, actually. You know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's in collaboration with, uh, with an Austrian group called IGIP, International Study in Education in Austria. Uh, we collaborated with them and they have a program like this, but uh, we have built on it and adapted it to the Indian conditions. It's, it's about a nine month program and these are some of the instructions that do it. Okay, we have some six modules. What are the principles of teaching and learning? How do you design curriculum so that it's outcome, you know, takes into account all the attributes that are needed? How to, how to have a dynamic classroom, not the type of classroom that I showed you, where everybody's sitting and, you know, and, and glazed over and, and you know, get them engaged, get them to talk to each other, small faults, small groups, for, you know, the, and, and, and so on. And how to harness technology and how to do collaborative learning on projects and then how to assess all of these things. Okay, so, so this course led by Dr. Veena Kumar and all of these faculty members, you know, phase one, you know, it, it used to be face to face. Now we've got to also had, we make that virtual uh, where all these concepts are talked about. But then the second phase is very important, okay? because uh, practical experience is important. They have to practically use this concept in a classroom that they are teaching in the second phase. So if a faculty member is teaching a certain course, a signal processing, let's say, they have to use the concept for each of the, all the, each of the modules in that classroom and, 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 and report the results, do assignments, and we use an LMS Canvas for them to report the results and then discuss with each other, with the faculty member, reflect on what they learned and share. So that is actually, learning teaching by doing teaching learning all these new practices by actually doing them not just memorizing new concepts about outcome based education because just as you know we are used to giving our students lectures where they just memorize stuff and pass exams we are also training our faculty to memorize the words in outcome based education and just pretend that they they're doing it and show the people coming out oh yeah i know all about you know, various terms in outcome based education we're doing it Wrong. Just like we are fooling our students are fooling us about that they know some concept by just memorizing it. We are memorizing these concepts and fooling the world that we are doing outcome based education. Okay, so let's get real and actually do yeah, do outcome based education, not just memorize uh, the concepts. Okay, so this in, in this thing we have in the last few years we started about a thousand, almost a thousand faculty have been certified uh, in this process, another thousand, and so it's a slow process, but I think it's been worked out very well. <laughs> another important. Uh, program in, in this is in collaboration with Purdue University in the United States is uh, my friend Bill Oaks. It's called Engineering Projects and Community Service, okay? Here again, and the fundamental concept is if you work on engineering projects, whether it is an engineering project uh, where you design a, a, a space shuttle or a, or a rocket engine, or you just work on a project in a local community where you're helping them with uh, maybe the clean water runs or some or some waste management or whatever, it's the, what the learning that you get is similar. The project experience is similar. Work in teams, identify the problem, work in teams, look at alternate solutions, communicate with each other and, and, and build prototypes and, 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 and sustainability uh, and our financial management. All of this show up whether you're working with a project in a local village or whether you're working on a, on a, on a spaceship. Okay, so, and that's what Bill believes in. And so he's designed thinking all of the built into it. So we're working with many colleges for our, many of our institutions and our consortium. Uh, we work, work with Bill and try to do these kinds of projects. And we've done hundreds of projects in the, in the last couple of years. It's difficult, it's not easy. We are finding it very, very difficult to get faculty to think along these lines. 
we have an annual conference, one coming up in January, where all our faculty share and collaborate, just as you have this conference where you're you know, talking. In our, in our conference, our faculty are actually doing the things that we just talked about in various courses. They talk about those things in different sessions and share with each other. And they present papers, which are published in the journal that we have. Our students also have similar venues where they share and collaborate and work together and learn and engineer, we will collaborate with engineering without borders because they have some of the similar things. And, 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 and so that's an important part of developing student leadership uh, by having student chapters and work with them. We have a global network. I was the president of International Federation of Engineering Societies and very active with ASWE and GEDC for all these years that I was in the United States. We continue to have the network with our faculty in India. Uh, and, and then we have various uh, groups of people from industry and academia. We form clusters and we uh, put people together and, and we say, okay, you know, let's every month get together and share what we're doing. And, and, and so we have annual leadership summit, very important for, trans for transformation to take place. Leadership has to understand what's going on. The principals, the vice chancellor, the deans, they really have to buy into this whole concept of quality improvement using you know, the types of approaches that I've talked about. So it takes time to do that. Once a year we do that, uh, we have partners of various types who have ABIT as, a, as our quality partner. As I said, Michael Milligan is very actively involved and have been coming twice a year you know, when it was uh, no COVID, but now of course everything is virtual, lots of folks. And, and so I will end with this concept, students must do projects to achieve these outcomes. So if there's one message out of my talk, Students must do projects to achieve the outcomes in the, in the outcome-based education. This informed design process is, an is, a, is a good way to approach this for faculty to take to use this approach for anything. Even in a math course, you can use the design thinking process for coming up with some projects that students can do. And there are ways to do that. You might be surprised. Okay, and 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 so the 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 the, the, the that's we had to focus on these attributes, which are. Uh, not easy to have, okay? They must do projects to achieve this outcome. This is not easy. And, and so we have to build an ecosystem which will include conferences, faculty workshops, leadership summits, student workshops, courses, and so on, the kinds of things that we have developed. And, and so with that, I'm going to end right there, okay? Thank you guys. And uh, open to any comments, questions, suggestions you might have. And I welcome, uh, in fact, I would, you know, I would, I would welcome East West University to, to join us. It's not, all, not just about India, Indian universities. We, it's a global effort. So East West University wants to be part of our consortium. We can talk about how to do that. Okay, thank you. Thank you so very, very much. Um, it's a very interesting presentation, basically outcome-based education is, is kind of new in our country. Uh, so we are really facing a lot of issues regarding assessment and addressing attributes. So on that regard, I think we have some time to discuss more details, uh, especially for the assessment part of uh, in this COVID situation we are facing uh, online education is very much not mature our, in our country. It's very kind of premature. We have to study, that's why we studied. So uh, before going, to, we have a couple of questions in the chat list, but uh, I just want to ask you uh, one specific question regarding the assessment. Some of the soft skills, uh, we, are, we, we do not, um, you know, traditionally we do not do this kind of assessment. Okay, so traditionally in our curriculum, we do not assess those soft skills. So how do, we incorporate this assessment. Uh, can you just elaborate on this, but especially sustainable issue, ethics issue, uh, yep. in the impact of society, and uh, so these are the very new, uh, you know, terminology in our engineering education. Even though these are the things, some form is there, we never yep. assess in in, in, a, in a professional format, right? So, yeah. So yeah, that, that's that's you're absolutely right. It's, it's not uh, it's not very simple to assess these skills. Like lifelong learning and uh, and working in teams and communicating all of those things, so so you you can actually document a project, okay? When you when you have a that's when you do when you have a student do projects, you can document the process by which they did projects, and therefore you, you document the, the 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 team members in the team, how many members in the team, and how often do they meet to communicate with each other, what the means by which they communicate with each other, and what kind of problems they faced while, while they were team members. And, 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 and so the process by which they go through that, and it's not easy. And, and the documentation might be uh, yeah, through videotapes or maybe short segments and, and put them together. 
and, uh, and so it, it, we have to think beyond just the conventional way of documenting. We are used to we're used to having examination system. We have question and answer, question and answer, question and answer, and this is that is the assessment. And we have group of yeah, but we have to think of, of, of assessment using of you know, of the projects as a whole, because when you have to prove to somebody that you have doing these things, the visitor comes right to the uh, you know the airbed accreditation, for example, might come, or in Bangladesh you might have accreditation agency that is coming and saying, okay, are you actually doing? Uh, you know, education in such a way that this, these outcomes are achieved. You have to bring in front of them the documentation, which might be non-traditional ways of doing it. it. Might be in the form of videotapes, in terms of projects, you actually show them in front, show them prototype, and say this is what was done, and bring the students together and and discuss with them. So it has to be done in a non-traditional way. You cannot just say, okay, I'm going to use a bunch of uh, ten pages of a report, and this is what's going to be uh, the outcome. Okay, so there's got to be in, different ways of doing that. But it can be done. You have to show that this is what they've done in the projects. And each project, then you could say, okay, here's how you address the uh, the the sustainability issue, how I, how I address the project management issue, and how I address the uh, team building issue, communication skills. Okay, how do you? So, so that is a not easy, but some people have, have done it, and I think we have to learn from others, from those people, how to move forward. Good. So, sir, um, can you also? elaborate a little bit on, on this special situation like a COVID. For example, we are having this difficulty of uh, especially using the, the psychomotor domain, like uh, the tool usage. So, and because if engineering is mostly practical oriented, like see if they don't work in the laboratory, it's very difficult to assess their, uh, you know, laboratory skills. So what should be the, uh, you know, a workable solution uh, in this special circumstance? Can you please? Uh, you have to have, yes, you know, writing laboratory reports is a skill by itself, okay? Writing, writing reports, that's a communication skill. Writing good reports and, 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 and so the faculty member has to be able to put down certain criteria that the report will be evaluated based on that. And in the report itself, then you have to you know, talk about how did I come up with this idea? Okay, they have to, I say one of the, one of the things in ABET is that you have to design experiments, okay? Most of the time what we do is in, Universities, we have uh, a given set of experiments. Somebody had decided 30 years ago, these are the experiments that have been done. And you continue to do again and again, and there'll be uh, people who would be, uh, you know, people who would be, uh, you know, so, so the, you know, and, and, and so they can again and again, you know, do the same experiments without changing them. Uh, but what, what we have to do is uh, have the students take the variables, important variables, and come up with their own experiments, design experiments on their own. And then, and then test, conduct them, and then report on them, and then find how the different, uh, uh, you know, different variables have impacted on it. You know, so, so that's, uh, you know, that's the kind of thing that you have to do rather than give them just cut, cook, cookie cutter uh, and standard experiments that we've had, continue to have in our curriculum. I mean, it's part of that will be, part of it will be still be there, but we have to enough of these different types of experiments in there. So you have to learn how to design experiments and, uh, and, and analyze the results and report on them. So all of the skills that the uh, that that are the non-technical skills that are in all the all the NBA and ABET can be incorporated into just designing experiments, developing experiments, conducting experiments, and uh, writing reports. But uh, the 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 time involved in assessment of these is is difficult. Okay. So what you really have to do is a sampling approach, a statistical sampling. So you have to say, okay, you, know, you take. Uh, if you have a class of maybe 100 students or 60 students or 50 students, okay, you divide them up into, into uh, the, the, uh, uh, the top 10%, you know, the middle 10% and then the bottom 10% students from the people. And then each, each case you point out, show examples of the work done by each of those groups of students. And within that point out how each of the attributes that ABET or NBA or other group wants to do point out where it is shown each of those. So you take a statistical approach, you can't show it for every student, but the faculty member who is, a, who is putting together the documentation to convince somebody to give the accreditation and to convince yourself that you're doing the right job, you have to take a statistical approach of taking a few students from different categories, from the best students, mediocre students and, and poor performing students and document what they're doing in each of these areas in that area. Maybe I don't know if that answered the question, but uh, hopefully that helps. 
Uh, we have a few questions from the audience. Uh, one of them <coughs> is using online platform, is it possible to achieve all 12 graduate attributes defined for OBE based course out curriculum? Uh, online is here to stay. We can't uh, yeah, help it. Okay, so online is here to stay. Uh, and, and, and so all over the world, there are some advantages and some disadvantages. It gives us an opportunity to access the best content in the world. So you can look around and find the best technique, next content for teaching in the world. And, and one of the um, concepts that has you know, become more popular nowadays in various places is called the flipped classroom. Okay, so the flipped classroom is where you have short videotapes of the best content that's available in that topic. And then have the students view that short videotape, not a one hour videotape or a, you know, because then that's not gonna do and accomplish much. Short videotapes and then come prepared to discuss that in class. So it's like, uh, instead of doing the classwork in the classroom and the homework outside, you have them do the classwork outside and then come to the classroom and do homework. Okay, so, so that, that approach of the flipped classroom is uh, even before COVID was becoming popular. Now we have to try to see, can we build on that by having online material from your own faculty or some other faculty made available to the students. And, and, and then during your online delivery, not just replicate what you did when you were in the classroom, where you went on and on for 50 minutes to give a lecture, PowerPoint slide after PowerPoint slide after PowerPoint slide. So most of our faculty are falling into the trap of converting their classroom PowerPoint slides into online PowerPoint slides and going on and on and on and on. And, 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 and then and the students are not you know, getting anything out of it. So you really have to break it down so that you can break down even the online sessions. And there's some uh, technologies like even Zoom is able to have breakout sessions. So having them breaking a lecture down into, into 10 minute segments and in first 10 minutes, um, you know, have talk about a concept, maybe something that you might have given a homework assignment where they have reviewed a videotape on the topic and then you can discuss a little bit more in 10 minutes in the online like we're doing right now. And then have them break out and discuss the concept on their own and they come back. You give them some questions to, to address when they're in the breakout session and then come back and, and talk with them. This kind of interactive dynamic classroom must be done. Okay, even the face-to-face -face situation, most of our traditional faculty members don't use that. As I showed in the slide, you could maybe just big, big classroom, teacher in front, one hour, bang, 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 and then go, go away, right? And then they give them homework assignments if you go and do homework at home and come back. The, even the traditional classroom has to change into breakout sessions and interactions and dynamic classroom. And, but now the, with online, it's even more difficult. But there are people have found tools. There are, you know, people, people are inventing new tools you know, in the different software, different platforms. We can actually have quizzes, different kind of quizzes. Every few minutes, you can have a quiz. That's a good way of interaction. Every few minutes, you can have, have them break out and have discussions. So people are developing these tools. And I think we have to learn how to incorporate all these tools. And I think the, some of the older faculty with gray hair, women like me, have more difficulty trying to figure out how to use these. But I think the, a lot of our younger faculty are really, and students are really uh, good at adapting to this technology, but only not to be able to watch out and make sure that the way they use it uh, is in a way that, in, uh, that engages students interactively. I think that's important. If you get students to interact with each other and students to interact with the faculty, all the things that we talked about can be accomplished. Yeah, but um, how about the practical oriented learning? Uh, the question here asked by one of the audience, is it difficult? It is difficult practical to conduct practic practice oriented learning in present situation. So how they're going to do the practical work in the lab? That's probably okay. one of the <laughs> issue people are- Major thinking. issue, big issue, yeah, yeah, big yeah. issue. How do you do that? Yeah, see, right. so that, that's why you cannot completely- Simulation uh, can be uh, one, but it's not actually uh, giving yeah. the alternate of the practical hands-on experience, right? right? So. So let me talk about that, uh, that the practical lab because engineering is about labs, right, laboratories. Right, right, right. So, so how do we, how do we uh, you know, so that cannot be completely replaced, okay? They, they, you, know, you have to have some portion, and that's why when, you know, after COVID, many people are planning that even if you can replace the, uh, uh, the, the, the classroom portions of education through online and blended approaches, uh, you must have you know, the actual laboratories in which they work. But, but keep in mind that there are some people now developing virtual labs. Okay, 
virtual labs are becoming more and more possible. And, 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 and so if you look into the whole scenario of virtual labs, there are quite a few interesting things that students can do, uh, experiments can, they can do, particularly in the, in the circuit branches, of course, in the, in the chemical engineering and mechanical engineering, they're much more difficult to do. Uh, we can actually perform experiments online and uh, using virtual uh, uh, labs that have been developed by various agencies and more and more of them will start coming. Uh, th in fact, there is a interesting uh, program that developed by one of our colleges in India, the Siddhi Kunga Institute of Technology, where the professor has done experiments in the laboratory, real experiments, and uh, with different variables, right? Let's say that each experiment has 10 different uh, variables that you have to perform experiments and see, you know, obtain a result and then and, and interpret, analyze, interpret the results to understand the concepts behind it. So he did, he and his team performed all the experiments live under all the possible different variables, okay? And each experiment was videotaped in great detail, okay? Good quality videotape. Okay, so now that database of the actual experiment running at, with different variables has now been put into a, a nice platform, okay? Where a student can go into that platform, understand the background a little bit, and then say, okay, now, you know, these are all the possible variables. I want to do an experiment with this and this combination of variables. And so click on this button, this temperature and this uh, voltage or something, click on those two. And then that immediately shows them the actual result, real result, real experiment that was done in the laboratory. They see the real result, okay? And, and, that, and that way, it's not the same thing as doing an actual experiment. They're seeing the real results virtually. And, and, and in this way, the advantage is that they can Play around with it and work with it a lot and analyze it. Uh, even in sometimes, even if our own laboratories, you know, when you have face-to-face -face laboratories, usually there'll be one piece of equipment sitting in one corner, and the 30 students just hovering around it, and only the front two, three people can see what's going on. The people behind cannot even see what's going on, and they're just talking among themselves, and they image write a report, right? So even in face-to-face -face labs, we have these problems, right? So in a virtual lab, maybe you can overcome this. Why everybody force everybody to actually have this kind of approach. And so, and so are, you know, people are developing these kinds of tools and technologies and smart people are doing that. So eventually we will have more and more of these with you know, using artificial intelligence and so on. So I, so I think there'll be some way uh, to bridge a little bit of uh, that deficiency in terms of practicality. I mean, I mean, you cannot learn how to ride a bicycle virtually, right? You have to get on the bicycle and learn. Right, so right. similarly, there are some things you cannot, you know, cannot, you cannot do virtually. Okay, I think this is the last question we have uh, in the session is, uh, is kind of interesting. How to manage the projects for a large group of students, for example, 200 students? How to manage? Large project, uh, the project yeah. for a large group of students. Yeah, uh, okay. So uh, that, that classroom that I showed, the, uh, the, remember I showed this classroom that I showed, what did I, uh, let's see where I, where I had that. Uh, I mean, sometimes you have to have classrooms big, okay? And, and most of our, you know, India and you know, in Bangladesh, I'm sure there are, you know, the hundred students in a classroom, right? So now I, I would not go into details of how to do this, but I, you know, I would recommend you to, to look at the videotapes of, uh, of my, one of my gurus, uh, who, uh, Richard Felder at North Carolina State University in the United States, okay? He will demonstrate to you, if he was out there as a professor there, he would demonstrate how we can engage every one of these students in in teamwork and group discussions and responsive in a dynamic classroom, it can be done. Okay, so that they're learning rather than my teaching and they're not learning. So the ways to do that. And, and, and that is why, uh, you know, it's teaching a lot of what happens is that uh, somehow, you know, we assume that if somebody has a master's or a PhD in some technical area, they automatically are good at teaching. Teaching, no, you have to learn teaching. In our, in our middle schools and high schools and all, we require teachers to go through a, B, a, a, a bachelor's of education. There is a whole theory that there's a, you have to learn how to teach better. You can't just have an MS or a PhD and get up and start teaching. No, that's, that's ridiculous. So you have to be able to have faculty go through courses where they learn about how to be more effective teachers. And that's why you know, we have these things that we do in various colleges over here. So that's important. So on that note, I'm going to stop. I'm, I know we run out of time. Thank you so very much. I uh, thank you all the participants as well. Uh, we have 168 participants at this point, the talk. So it's really encouraging to learn uh, new thing uh, from the various expertise.
So thank you so very much. And with that, I'm uh, including, uh, I, I'd like to conclude this session. And we have a break of 10 minutes. I guess next session will start at 10 or something like that. Thank you so very much. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you, Professor Chaudhary, for conducting the session. And thanks, Professor, Professor Vedula, for your excellent talk on achieving, uh, uh, achieving global excellence. Uh, as most engineering programs around the world are performing not very well in regards to developing the outcomes of professional skills among students, we hope the effort of consortium of 50 engineering colleges from India, which is actually guided by hundreds of experts, will be successful in near future. Thank you again, Professor Vedula. Thank you.